thanks very much for joining us. Always good to talk to you. You've raced at Phillip Island quite a number of times. So um, what are some of your favourite memories of, uh, of the Australian Grand Prix and especially at Phillip Island? Being Australian and then winning the first race, without a doubt, the 89 Phillip Island race was probably uh, a most memorable one. I never thought I had the speed to win it. I went into the race and Donna was sitting next to me saying, I said, I'm too tired because I'd spent three months doing PR and marketing around Australia to every news outlet. And when I got there, I was exhausted, you know, from it all and never thought I had the, the, the cojones to go out there and ride as hard as I did. But, you know, when you're riding in front of your home crowd, Chris, you, you'd know this. So yes. when you try and ride in front of your home crowd in your home track, there's a, the, you, you lift, you get this special energy. You can see the people cheering and you can see the, the crowd waving and, uh, and it just spurs you on to go out and do bigger and better things that you think is impossible. But it's the national pride that, that brings that home. And, uh, and I think we're all proud of what Phillip Island Circuit and the Grand Prix in Australia have, have been and will be in the future. It was inspirational, those races. I was a young fellow, Wayne, but, you know, never forget them. And, and uh, what you did in those early years, it was, it was great you to mean watch. You mean a lot younger than me? <laughs> <laughs> year or two. That's why we never raced together, obviously. <laughs> I think one of the greatest legacies that I've left behind is Phillip Island. Because uh, with, when Bob Barnard approached me and told me of his dream, um, at that time he was running the Adelaide Formula 1 race and uh, he started watching the bikes with myself and then Mick coming along and he came to me and said, I want to do something with bikes in Australia. And I said, oh, well, that'd be, that's a nice idea, but where? And yeah. so I've got an idea. So, and then eventually he came back to me and said he found a place called Phillip Island. And um, primarily the, the circuit was a dirt track uh, a circuit originally for cars. And then over the years it was brought into a bitumen. And then of course, uh, then it was dilapidated and, and overrun with uh, farming animals. And then um, Bob came along and wanted to bathe it and build something big and new. So without a doubt, my greatest memory and probably legacy I've left is Phillip Island. How does the Australian Grand Prix compare to other races on the calendar? Obviously it's a fly away is a big difference, you know, but uh, how does it compare for you? Well, Phillip Island's unique because it's the only island um, that there's a race <laughs> trap in the calendar for a start. And it's got a beautiful backdrop. You know, if you ever see it on TV, you see the blue ocean in the background. It's a great circuit, as you know, because it's fast. And I regard it as a dirt track. As if I was riding around a dirt track at like Nepean or something like that. Yes. Uh, and I re but it's been bitumen, you know, and it's kind of really cool. And as you know, you slide the bike around a lot onto the main straight and then you slide it off the main straight and then coming uh, the fast left before Honda Corner, you're sideways around there and, <laughs> and even across um, the barn, you can get a bit sideways there. Um, uh, so there's a lot of fantastic corners and the beauty of it is that because it's such a fast flowing circuit, uh, it keeps everybody together and it creates great racing. It's very hard to break away and get a, a breakaway situation where you can actually get away and pull away. Um, because you can catch a water's draft in some of the fast sections. So, yeah, it's, um, it's, I think it's the, the most fun uh, track in the world. If you talk to the whole paddock, everyone loves going to Phillip Island. The older riders, the retired riders like yourself, love Phillip Island, the young ones do. Who do you think are tougher? You know, the riders from the 80s or 90s or the current crop of guys? Look, I think any rider that becomes a champion or in the top five, the guys, they're all very talented. It doesn't matter what era, whether it's the Hailwood days right through to the Rossi and Marquez days. Uh, it all depends on the machinery that's available. It all depends on the circuit. And it also depends on the tyre quality now, you know? So of course, yes. Tyre development from the days when I raced, um, pray to yours, it jumped a lot and then it's jumped even further amount and it's just jumping again and again and again. Your lap times have been broken because of that machinery. They've got more power, faster and so on. So who's, who's braver? Mm, I think probably the guys from, from our era, from the two stroke era were probably the bravest because yep. the bikes never had any electronics. There was no control. There was safety fences up against the track. 
Um, you know, it was a number of times I've hit barriers and concrete walls and it's not pleasant. And they've improved track safety a lot. Um, Phillip Island's gone through many changes of, of doing that and giving them more runoff areas. The bikes have built, have got faster, the speed, the corner speeds have got faster. So they have to do that sort of stuff now. However, the riders have airbags in their suits now. They've got <laughs> um, traction control and anti-wheelie and anti this and anti that. And time moves forward and the equipment gets better and the speeds are picking up. And so, but a good rider will adapt to any situation. It doesn't matter whether it's the 80s or whether it's, you know, the 2020 season. So the difference is that the bikes of our day were very, very difficult to ride. And they were like light switches. As soon as you open the throttle, they, you only had to open it just a, a hair, not even a millimetre, but less than a millimetre. And it would fling you straight over the bars. It was that sensitive, you know? You're exactly right. The modern day bikes are, they're very easy to ride. They're just hard to go oh, fast. It's like a road bike. It's like a road bike. You're exactly right, Wayne. So. Uh, talking about the old days, your rivals, some of your big rivals, Eddie Lawson, Wayne Rainey, Kevin Schwantz. Do you still get on with those guys? Yeah, or do you okay. now? Because you probably didn't when you were racing, so I should well, say. I didn't know you were correct. Um, look, I hadn't seen Eddie for many years and, you know, we were arch, arch enemies, but we were friends off the track. But on the track, like every rider, even your teammate, you're enemies yes. with them, you know what I mean? So no. we all want to win that, that one trophy and there's only one of the things, you know? So, yeah. uh, you know, it's funny because after when I stopped racing and then Eddie did and Rainey and Rainey got injured and, and Kevin and uh, Mick and, and we've all become friends. You know, yeah. we might be arch enemies, but, but off the track now and especially Eddie, you know, like I never, we, we've had some parties together, but I've had better parties with him since then you know, yeah. like it's Luca or some event we've been to where he's been there and we go out and have a laugh and think of ourselves as silly then, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and we put our swords down, we don't fight anymore and we just laugh and giggle at our stupidity at the time. So, no, i got some great friends, uh, great memories and, um, and I went through all this exercise, especially when they did the movie on myself, you know, because sure. they were interviewing them certain questions, all the writers, which they did everybody right through to even Rossi. And they, they asked them similar things and the, everyone said the same things. Oh, yeah, we we're all enemies in our day because we all want the same trophy. But <laughs> at the end of the day is now we're all great friends with respect for each other more than anything else. No, that's, that's really good to hear. I can, I can relate exactly. So talking about the future now, your son, he had a good start to this year. But uh, what's the future hold for him and, and what's going to be, what's a successful season this year for Remy Gardner? Well, the season isn't um, happening much at this moment. I think he's no, well, the first race, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he got off to a good start. Uh, it's a pity that he dropped back four and a half seconds or something behind, um, and I didn't see what happened. But when I talked to him, he said that he got some of the when his bike has a full tank of fuel, it lacks speed. He's seventy kilos, and um, he's not enormously heavier than the rest, but he's, you know, 10 kilos up on some of these guys. So he lacks it. When you're in, in, it hurt him when he was in Moto3 and it's hurting him now in Moto2. His goal is obviously to get to MotoGP and I think for him, the sooner the better. He started off so good last year, but then uh, he did a couple of, mm, there was, he was a little bit unlucky and he did a couple of mistakes last year and that cost his confidence. And when his confidence left, he couldn't get it back and, um, and then I, I, I wasn't any part of it about mid-year through. He threw the spanners at me and told me to get out of the garage and, you know, <laughs> I don't know, and so on, which is, I guess, I, look, I don't hold it against him. It's just a frustration as a racer. You, you've been there and done that. Sure. And um, so I stood back and watched last year and, yeah, he could have done a lot better than what he should have done. Um, he speeds there. He's definitely fast. There's no doubt in that. Um, he should have won Assen. But the bike broke down. It was jumping out of gear. Just really disappointing because he he came through and he just about got into the lead in front of Bender and then it started jumping out of gear and he went backwards and then try and tried to persist with it and ran into a neutral into the corner and ran into the dirt and fell over. Um, really unlucky. He should have won that race and I was expecting him to win it and so was he. And he had, he said he had the pace and in fact I see him ride ride all the way right around the outside of of uh, Marquez. You know so. Yep. He's, got, he's got some serious pace, but there was some, he was unlucky at times, but he also did a few mistakes, um, pushing too hard, too early. Uh, Hareth, you know, on a new tyre, 
got into the corner and um, didn't yep. scrub the tyre in enough, opened the throttle up and trying to race for the top three in the first corner and a high side in, then he got run over by Marquez and everything else. And I was more scared than anything else when I seen that. Um, but he wasn't in a good mood prior to the race. Uh, I could tell and knew something was gonna happen. And, um, you know, he's gotta learn how to control himself a little bit better uh, in preparation for an event and during the event as yes. well, like better strategy. But, you know, these are the things of young guys. Remy was only 21, you know, last year when he was doing yes. all this. So, you got to give it to him. He's still very, very young, you know, but he's very, very fast. So I think um, when he gets back on the bike this year, I'm sure he's going to have some good results. But, you know, he is riding a 2019 bike this year because the team lost their sponsor and and he's got his bike from last year, which is we've kind of gone back to the previous years where he was using old machinery again. So it's a little bit disappointing. But, however, hopefully next year, and I can't say too much, there's some some changes that might happen. Yeah, exactly. No, it was a fantastic race, that, that opening one in Qatar. It's pretty we haven't been able to see him since. But like you say, on the older bike, still finishing fifth, he had the speed. So it was good to see. But continuing on with Remy, um, just out of the blue, can you tell us something different about him? Something we don't know about Remy Gardner. Well, I just noticed yesterday he had a haircut. Have you seen that? <laughs> We've been after him to have his haircut short for years and years and years. And then I noticed on social media, uh, that he's had it all clipped off and like to a crew cut, you know, so um, <laughs> about Remy, that's interesting. Um, you know, he's very passionate about his cars. You've probably seen that. He's yeah. a very, very clever engineer. He's um, for his age and for his uh, lack of training. Um, he's an exceptional welder, an exceptional machinist. He's got his little lathe now and uh, manufacturing stuff and rebuilding engines. He's a funny guy. He's very funny and he's very <laughs> passionate. And he's, but he's also very committed when he gets his eyes in on something, he doesn't like to lose. And um, he's got that fire in his belly and that big commitment. Just to finish off, just a couple of quick fire questions. What was your first motorcycle? Uh, it's a Yamaha AG, an ag bike, 80cc. And I bought it uh, in partnership with my mate, uh, Barry Sisson, and it cost us $5. So it was $2.50 <laughs> each. And it had a rusted engine and no back wheel. And I told my mum, I ran home because I was actually looking, uh, I was looking for um, copper and brass and, you know, m material to cash in to get petrol for my go-kart that my dad built for me with a lawnmower engine. And I used to drive that around the school playgrounds on the weekend. So <laughs> we were looking for, for scrap material and ended up finding that old bike and, and my mate's dad restored the engine and, uh, I advertised in all along Illawarra Mercury and got a, a rear wheel for, for Honda and grafted it into this thing and we got it going, you know, and it cost us all of about 50 or $60 or something. So, but we had to share it, which I wasn't really into too much because I wanted to ride it all the time. So exactly. that's where the love started, Chris. That's where it started. And, um, and continuing on, what, what is your dream motorcycle? Or have you had it? Mm, my dream motorcycle, uh, without a doubt, was my 92 NSR 500. Yeah. It was just perfect that year. Um, it's a pity I didn't win the championship, but, uh, you know, got injured again, and so did Mick. Um, bikes are getting better all the time. I've ridden some of the latest MotoGP bikes. They're incredible. But, you know, they miss that special excitement, acceleration. Uh, of two strokes that's what i think so still a big fan of two strokes as you can imagine but bikes are getting better every year and um probably they'll even get faster in the future with this electric age coming with electric bikes yeah i agree with you that things are going to keep evolving for sure so absolutely yeah wayne always a pleasure to chat it's great to hear your stories hopefully we're going to get some uh, motorcycle racing soon um let's wait and see fingers crossed thanks wayne yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good on you.